All right, we saw in the book of Titus last week that Paul writes uh, to Titus and a, a little bit more background on Titus, knowing what we do know and uh, a lot of what we don't know uh, about the island of Crete and when Paul could have gone there. If it's not the three missionary journeys, which it's not in the book of Acts, and then Acts ends with his house arrest in Rome, but it says he lived there two years. And then a fourth missionary journey is very likely after that house arrest and before his final arrest where he's not in a house, he's in a prison. He's going to be beheaded likely mm -hmm. uh, by Nero. And so if you look at first and second Timothy and the book of Titus, you'll see places which he writes uh, after that fourth journey or uh, about meeting and bringing uh, a cloak and meeting you here and so it it's likely that he went to uh, several places and those places are listed in first and second timothy and titus and so you'll see uh, places cities some of them are uh, familiar that he's been to before like uh, colossi uh, the book of philemon uh, mentions colossi um, ephesus and corinth uh, and then obviously he went to the island of Crete sometime. And so we're going to assume it's that last missionary journey that we don't have in the book of Acts. And so if it is that last journey, and we know when 2 uh, Corinthians was written, Titus is a trusted companion of Paul in 2 Corinthians, which we saw him mention Titus by name several times. And he's going to send Titus to the Corinthians, and he's got the same heart that Paul has for the Corinthians and was going to minister to them the same way Paul would. And so there's probably about a decade, about 10 years from when he writes Second Corinthians and they go on this last journey, uh, roughly 10 years. And so Titus has been trained by Paul, trusted by Paul, sent out by Paul to go to the Corinthians at least 10 years earlier. And now he's probably... Titus may be a middle-aged man, probably similar in age to, to Timothy. And so he is obviously here in this book, uh, a trusted uh, man who is going to have a, a pretty big job. And so Titus 1 lays out the job that is given uh, to, uh, to Titus in this book. And we said last time that it would have been a welcomed uh, book of instruction if Titus is on this island. And uh, you'll look at next week with Pastor Ty uh, what the island of Crete was like and why they needed a healthy, healthy churches there. And our culture is quickly becoming <laughs> like uh, the island of Crete was, was known for. So the foundation of the healthy church is being laid. And we said last, uh, last time, two weeks ago, that uh, a non-essential, uh, a and essential, not a non-essential, and essential for the healthy church is built on salvation. There is, there is no church without salvation, and there's no healthy church without a constant emphasis <clears throat> and all of the words that you saw of hope, of the word, of um, uh, truth and grace and peace, um, focus on God the Father and our Savior, uh, Christ Jesus. So a tremendous uh, summary of how important salvation is to a healthy church is verse 1 to 4. Now we get into verses 5 to 9 today. And still working on the foundation of, of, um, of a healthy church is, uh, we'll, we'll come to a conclusion at the end. Verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. All right, so question here for verse five. What is Paul's reasons for leaving Titus in Crete? According to verse five, what do you see there? Okay, so leadership. Uh, and um, it says every town, so it likely is a, a few churches uh, and elders in each of those churches. Anything else? First part of the verse. <clears throat> Let me 
you see. Can you come by this evening? Mm hmm Put things in order. Put things in order, of which elders are part of that order. Mm -hmm. So okay. how do churches get structured? And if you are, if you're, and I'm talking to people now around us that have never been in a church and would don't doesn't know how a church functions and so when i'm talking to uh, a friend of mine who i'm i'm helping with a job and i keep referring to people in my church well i know a guy that does this and i <laughs> borrow in this tool and I'm, I'm helping uh this family and they're like well, you guys are like a big family <laughs> at church yeah. and we are yeah. we're a big family <laughs> at, at church and but how do you organize a family, the bigger the family, the more organization is required. If there's three people or it's just a husband and a wife in a family, okay, there's organization there, but not as much as if you have eight kids, you mm -hmm. better be organized or you're going to have chaos. Mm -hmm. So how about a hundred kids mm -hmm. in a church? You're going to have to have organization. And so part of that organization is elders. Okay. Um, and he uses the word elder that is uh, mentioned elsewhere, the most common name for the uh, position uh, over churches. And he says, appoint them uh, elders in every town as I directed you. So this is a reminder to Titus, because as Paul and Titus are ministering together, and you can imagine as they go out and minister and they're seeing people saved, they go back home at dark or whatever, and they have a meal and they talk about strategies. And you can see Paul saying, okay, for long-term success on this island, Titus, you're going to have to establish churches. And churches are going to need leaders. And those leaders we call elders. If you go back to, we're not going to, but if you go back to Acts 14, the end of the first missionary journey, Paul goes through at least four towns twice on that first missionary journey. And he goes back through, and as he goes back through the same towns that he went, at the very end, um, near the end, he got stoned. He went to Derby, and then he goes back to Lystra, where he got stoned, and then um, two other towns, Iconium, I believe, and Antioch. Um, he strengthens the churches, and he appoints elders in every church. So when I preach through the book of Acts, he is establishing churches for long-term healthiness, healthy a long-term longevity of a healthy ministry, a healthy church is having elders. Not just any people can be elders, though, because now he's going to go into detail in verses 6 to 9. It's going to look a lot like 1 Timothy 3 in the qualifications for um, uh, leadership. And so uh, having a healthy church, it does, it starts with, uh, with leaders. All right, verse six. All right, and let's look at verse um, six. I'm going to have you read um, six, and you'll see the word above reproach. And what sphere of influence is the elder supposed to have um, to be a godly leader? I'll let you read verse six. And then what is the sphere of influence that a church should evaluate their leaders and say, this person is qualified as an elder because of what? Okay, so how would we summarize that into a, a word? Okay, blameless, above reproach, he says. What sphere of influence is this highlighting? The home, right. So uh, a one woman man is the is the translation of uh, the Greek. He is not going to have uh, in this day, and there's some cultures today where polygamy, and it may come back in our culture, uh, where polygamy is acceptable socially. It's never going to be acceptable in the church because of this. A one woman man uh, known for his purity, um, faithfulness to his wife, and then children are believers. It also, another translation, you may have a footnote that says they're faithful uh, and they're not 
open to a charge of debauchery, which is being wild, out of control, and insubordination, which is rebellious. So while they're in the home, the home is um, a place where husband and wife are getting along as examples in of marriage, and then the children are obedient uh, to, uh, to the parents. So godliness. Where have we seen the word godly already in the book of Titus? Look back at uh, the first four verses and in verse one. Yeah, so godliness is the fruit of God's choosing and we're trusting God choosing us to be his child and we're growing in knowledge of the truth. And what does that look like? It looks like godliness. And you'll see in verses six to nine that the overall overarching word that we could come up with that is a the example, elders are godly men. And they're godly in their home. And we'll see more spheres here as we go through uh, verses seven uh, to nine. Let's look at verse seven. Well, let's read verse six. If anyone is above reproach, uh, also blameless, uh, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and are not open uh, to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, then we would say this man uh, is qualified to be mm -hmm. an elder because his home is in order. He's a godly leader at home. Uh, verse seven, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. Same word there uh, also means blameless. Okay, so he reiterates the blamelessness, blamelessness at home, and now blamelessness in outside the home too. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. All right, so what does this verse teach about how the godly elder sees himself. Look at these words and how does he see himself that is helpful and so that he doesn't live like the end of verse 7? Yeah, what's another way? We don't use the word steward very much uh, today. Any other... Uh, I don't know if you have a footnote there. Servant. A servant, okay. Mm -hmm. Any other? A manager, okay. So you're just God's manager. Just like Joseph was the manager for Potiphar and he didn't own anything. He's just managing. If you go and you're the manager of a store, a restaurant, wherever, and you're not the owner. The owner hired you to manage. You don't own anything. You don't have the freedom to do whatever you want because you are under the authority of the owner. The owner has authority to do whatever he wants because he's the owner. But if we see ourselves as, and I'm an elder at our church, I've got to see myself as God's steward. And as God's steward, I don't own the church. Now, there are some cults that think <laughs> I own the church. I can do what I want. No, I'm just, I'm just uh, God's steward. And this is how, Titus says, is encouraged by Paul to, to look at godly men and they're going to oversee the church um, as God's steward, their managers. They must be above reproach. And if they're going to be uh, blameless in their character, they need to see themselves as a steward and just as a steward. So this has the idea of humility. If you look at humility, according to verse 7, the last part of verse 7, that's the opposite of all these things. Humility is the opposite of being arrogant, quick-tempered, drunkard, violent, greedy for gain. Why would a steward be greedy for gain? Because he doesn't really own it. And so there are CEO-type pastors elders that think they own the church and that is that's not the case and uh, because of 
and take sole authority for themselves. And when you have, according to here, uh, a plurality of leadership in verse five that says appoint elders, plural in every town, singular. You'll see that in Acts, uh, thir Acts 14, that they were appointing elders in every church. So uh, there, there wasn't a single leader. You'd say, well, Paul was a single leader. Titus is the single leader here appointing this. But this is just appointing elders, and he's not planning, Titus isn't planning to lead all these churches. He's helping them to be established, healthy, and then he's going to lead. Actually, in, uh, you'll see, I think, in, he's going to be replaced by a couple other men, and Paul may have another role for Titus as he helps these churches get established. But a steward is just a steward, a manager, and he is humble. When a... When a man thinks that he has, he is the king of his home or the king of the church, um, he's going to see himself as arrogant, and you're, you're going to see it coming out of his life if he thinks, I've got a position that um, I've got to be demanding. He's quick temper when people don't do what he wants to do. He will think nothing of getting drunk. He will think nothing of using force, being violent, and he will think nothing of using the church to get wealthy. And uh, second, our first Timothy six talks about the love of money is the root of all evil, and he's talking about uh, leaders of the church there as well. First, so first Timothy six talks about the love of money being the root of all evil, and so we can't be greedy uh, for gain. So when as someone is a steward, he's humble. And humility is the opposite of verse 7, but look at verse 8 now, in contrast. So, a proud person is looking and leading in a way to get something from the people he's leading. You heard, you may have heard the expression, shearing the sheep. <laughs> like, pastors that are not good elders are looking to what can the congregation do for me? And you'll live like verse 7. However... Verse eight is the is the positive. So instead of using people to get their resources, mm -hmm. think of verse eight as the elder is using his resources to help people. Okay, that that's the godly leader there in verse eight. But hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. So what, do you, what are some of the opposites that you see from verse the end of verse 7 uh, to, to verse 8? Do you see anything that are obvious opposites? Something mm hmm Yeah. Self-control. Right. Quick tempered and self control. Good. Anything else? Mm hmm. Someone who's greedy for gain. Think of how someone uses their home. Greedy to gain a home or using their home to help other people. That's hospitality. Okay. So greedy to get something and then willing to use what you have to give. That's hospitality. Okay, so those are those are opposites. Um, so why would you why would you want to follow a leader like verses six and eight? When you see someone that's like six and eight, what makes you want to follow them? Lead you in the right way. Okay. Towards godliness. Towards godliness. You can trust them. Trust is very important mm -hmm. for relationships, especially with leaders at church and people at church. Anything else that? Copy. I, I would look at the, the bad person compared to the good person. The bad person, he's trying to get all this stuff. The other person is in peace mm -hmm. and in quietness and helpful and you can count on. Okay, right. So he's trustworthy. 
right? Someone you'd want to be a neighbor with. <laughs> Anything else? What if you needed advice? Would you want to come to someone who has had <clears throat> been married eight times <laughs> for marriage advice? Someone who none of their kids are living for the Lord. Would you want to come to them for parenting advice? How about verse eight? Um, or someone that was like verse seven. How do you, you feel like you need to confront your leader every time you see them because they're so arrogant. And when you do confront them, they point it back to you. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you doing confronting me? I I'm the leader here. Like, and that happens once or twice. And then you're like, I just can't talk to them anymore. So there are the conversations that the, the healthy aspects of a local church should be the elders leading the people and the people helping uh, the elders. And uh, this will happen when we have godly qualified leadership. So those are, if we were to summarize verses um, six to eight, we'd probably summarize it with godly character. Right? You can see godly character at home, godly character broadly in outside the home where everyone can see if they are arrogant or quick-tempered or, or drunkard or violent or greedy and see outside the home as well if they're hospitable, a lover of good, etc. in verse 8. But verse 9 is going to match uh, ability to teach or apt to teach from 1 Timothy 3. And so let's see how this is one one thing that is not character, it is ability in verse 9. So verse 9, um, what are um, the elders to do in the first phrase of verse 9? And see if you can put that in your own words instead of just quoting the first part of verse 9. You must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. All right, so how would you explain? Okay, teaching the truth. Walking with God. Okay, walking with God. Being first of what? Okay. Being steadfast in doctrine. Okay. Yeah. Holding firm. Now, there are some things that I will teach and will will teach here at, at church that we don't hold really firm on because eh, we're not a hundred percent sure. But there are uh, things that we're going to hold firm to, like there's one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> we're not. We're going to hold so firm to that, and we are not going to. Or Jesus is is fully God and fully man. Oh yeah, we're holding firm to that. All right. So by his example, the elders are to hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. So this is them as a student. So elders aren't just teachers. They're the best students or they're, they're learning the word. So Paul and Titus have gone to this island. They have taught the word of God. There have been people who have trusted Christ as their savior. Now they're in the church and Titus stays back. Paul leaves and says, okay, Titus, these are what you look for in elders. And you look for men who have this godly character in verses 6 to 8, but then you look at how they embrace the word. Are they trusting in God's word as you are teaching? They are, <laughs> they're getting more and more holding firm to the, the truth and letting go of, of false teaching and identifying false teaching and saying that is not what God's word says, okay? And so that's, that's one aspect of the elder is he is an example of how he learns. And then the rest of the verse is an example of, you'll see the word able. So that, so the, the reason he is learning in the first part of verse nine is so that he has the ability to do something with that learning in the second part of verse nine. What do you see there? With instruction and sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And rebuke. Right. All right. So as a 
if you are um, ever to teach a Sunday school class or junior church, or you're a parent and you've got kids in your home, I mean, we've all uh, we've all taught somebody something, okay? <laughs> and in any size group, there are some who want to learn, and there are some who don't want to learn. Okay, <laughs> so what? Who do we teach as as teachers? All right, we want to teach everybody. Well, not everybody wants it. Okay, so there are two two people, two groups of people here that were teaching the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but one is receiving the instruction wants it and those who are not receiving what are they doing here in this verse they are contradicting it so you ever had a student that contradicted what you said oh yeah come on like this is not hard <laughs> uh yeah we've all been there and like okay you can only beat your head against the wall so many times if someone doesn't want and wants to contradict everything you say and eventually you can say, and I've said this as a parent and as a teacher, you know what? If you know better, you should be the teacher. Or I can't help you. Uh, fools learn the hard way. Wise people learn the easy way from instruction. But mm -hmm. fools will have to learn a, another way. Uh, the school of hard knocks, usually. Um, but wise people learn from instruction and they learn from other people's mistakes. So what do we see here as the elder's job? He is learning the word. He's holding firm to it as he was taught the word. And I'm, I'm going to assume here in verse 9 that he is constantly learning the word. So he is, the more he's learning the word, he's trusting it. You see the trustworthy word? He's learning it. He's holding firm to it. The more he learns of it, he's like, oh man, this is the really good stuff. And he's holding it and he's holding it. And, and Titus can tell who, the, who these men are because they are doing, they're going the extra mile with what mm -hmm. has been taught. And now Titus is going to give them responsibility. Okay, so what you have learned, Titus could, could have a, a Bible study. And what you've learned as elders in training, go and give instruction to someone else. Okay, and when you find people that want it, you give them more and more of the sound doctrine, the really good doctrine. But there's going to be people that are going to contradict sound doctrine. So what do we do with them? We rebuke them. Okay, so it, it takes boldness. It takes discernment and boldness to know who to teach. Everybody's not the same. When we teach, we teach those who want to learn. And as an elder, there are people that want to learn every Sunday, and that's who I teach. There are people who want to contradict, or they fall asleep every Sunday. And you know what? I don't really look at them that much because they don't. <laughs> they may want to learn, but I'm not. I'm not getting. It, okay, I'm not, you can't. Uh, every week uh, that that uh, you look disinterested. And I'm boring you to tears by having you sit in the in the congregation, in the pew. Um, but those who want it, those who are soaking it in, um, as an elder, as Titus knows who to spend time with, he's going to spend a lot more time with leaders and those who want to be taught. All right, so how can we summarize verses 5 to 9 when it comes to healthy churches? What does a healthy church need? They need in verses one to four, they need salvation. Okay, yeah. now there are people that are saved. Next thing Paul tells Titus is what? Verses five to nine. How would we summarize verses five to nine? Be a healthy leader. Healthy leader. Want to add anything to that? Study so you can teach us. Mm hmm. They need student studying leaders. How would we give a little more focus to the word healthy leader? What do we see in the text? A godly leader, right? A holy leader. So a, a leader is a private example and a public example. If you have a wayward child and they said, my dad was godly, he, he almost forced us to read the Bible and pray together but I didn't like it. And I wanted to leave that home. Okay. Well, there's, there's a godly leader. 
children, I don't think can cause their parents to be disqualified if they re reject. And I know, I know of a very godly pastor who three of his four kids have walked away from God. But I would still follow him as, as a godly leader. And I still would learn from him mm -hmm. because of how he conducted his home. His wife would agree. And, um, and that, that may be the case. Um, we, our kids are not robots to, or computers to program or to train. And then they all turn out <laughs> living for the mm -hmm. Lord and doing exactly what we told them. Um, they do have a free will, right? So healthy churches need godly leaders who are an example in private and public. And they know the word. They hold fast to the word. They teach the word. And they're bold enough to rebuke those who contradict the word. And so part of the foundation of um, a healthy church is, is leadership. So as a church, we want to not just be content with our leadership. And say, okay, we got four elders, we're all set. No, I, if we're going to do what is the healthy church, I think we're going to see that there are relationships that are built and that we want to plant other churches that are going to have godly leaders. And those churches are going to be able to plant other churches that have godly leaders. So we're in the business here of raising up godly leaders and godly homes where we can. Um, serve the Lord and help uh, establish healthy churches.